Um, just back uh, some much can come in. Uh, <laughs> um, so I am Julia Tonellata. I'm a PhD candidate in mechanical engineering. Um, and I'm going to present you here, uh, like in my PhD work that is focused on a, like a counter strategy evaluation framework for ground source heat pumps using standing cone wells. And uh, to put my work in a context, you should know that uh, space heating in commercial buildings is about 50, 55 to 60 percent of energy use in Canada. And uh, um, to try to reduce this impact and also the em emissions that are correlated to, to that, um, to reduce it, the most conventional retrof retrofit solution is usually to have um, a ground coupled heat pump using uh, closed loop boreholes. Um, the, in which you inject a fluid in a tube and, uh, and then in the ground. But usually this kind of solution is quite expensive. So like to, to try to, uh, to reduce the, the cost, uh, an alternative solution that has been studied in the last years as you, as you uh, have seen in the last uh, couple of hours <laughs> is called standing column well. It's quite as much have been already presented um, a, lot, um, a lot in the last presentations. The heat extraction power is about five times more. So that, that's, uh, uh, and that's a good point to, uh, to start to, to reduce the cost. And there are, but there are still some obstacles to overcome uh, for, this, for this kind of technology. And it's a lack of easy to use design tools and also some peak, peak demand management. And my, my, my work is most, mostly focused on this last point. Um, and he, here you can see like a comparison. Uh, okay, standing color was already presented quite, quite much. But here I compare it to, to the two most like known systems, closed loop and open loop. Um, so it's like kind of a mixture of between the two. Uh, you you inject, uh, you use groundwater as much as open loop systems, but then you inject part of it in another well that is called the bleed process. Uh, it was Sagnet en français, but it's uh, bleed on, in English. And then you what what you um, so when you inject most of it in the same well, just as like closed loop system. And, um, but for, for, this, for this use of groundwater, the, the, most, of the, um, most of the of the heat transfer is still advection, but there's also a little bit of conduction, but the advection uh, allows the, the system to have a really high power uh, per meter, like start per meter of well compared to a closed loop system. And this makes uh, this system kind of, uh, much more economic, but it, it requires uh, some aquifer productivity, but not as much as the open loop system. Um, and uh, so the standing column wells was <laughs> presented in all other presentations. Um, so one point in favor is that, the, that the, since you reinject most of it in the same well, low compliances are, uh, are easier. Groundwater availability is, is lower compared to open loop wells. Um, then we already explained about the bleed process that increases the performance of the system. Um, and uh, but even without bleed, there is a lot of advection, um, and it's still like 265, 265 times higher than heat conduction, and this allows like to to have about five times more uh, watts per meter. And uh, but the only the, the point to be careful about is the risk of groundwater freezing after the heat exchanger. Like this water in, interacts with a heat exchanger, then then interacts with the heat pump and the building. Uh, and the and, and the risk is that um, when you when you have a high power demand from the building that the water goes above freezing point that is zero degrees, uh, but but this must be avoided and um, and there are uh, several ways uh, to do that. And one one way that I'm trying to address is to use um, a, a smart power demand management. So what what it means what it means that you if you have a, a, a a moment which you know that there's, there's going to be a, a, a huge peak, like a, for example, when you transit from a, a lower indoor temperature in the school, that is 19 degrees to 21 uh, during the day, you know that in the transition is going to be a high, a high peak um, because of the uh, because you must heat up all the school. Um, and in this case, like in this particular example, there's a lot of electric auxiliary resistance power. That is this one in, in orange. And this, but this is must absolutely avoided because it requires a lot of power. So, uh, so here you can see that, uh, of course, power peaks can be also caused by a very low temperatures outside, high wind speed for the infiltration, uh, and the higher power peaks can cause like cost, like capital cost and operating costs. Operating costs 
uh, for example, in Quebec, there is the either Quebec rate and that accounts for the maximum power required during winter and the capital cost because you're not in, for the heat pump here in blue or the auxiliary, uh, auxiliary you still need to install more power if you need more power. Um, so what, what, what it can be done is a, is a system, kind of a new control system that is called predictive control, uh, MPC, that is the acronym for a model predictive control. And here you can see a little, a little schematic of it. Like if you, if you use weather forecast uh, and you use a model that interprets the, the, the forecast to, to, um, to calculate the loads, you can know, uh, you can know with some advance uh, of, of, the, of the peaks and the problems that, can, that, could, that could be in the building. So uh, based on this, you can control the wells and also the building uh, to adapt and, 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 to, and to optimize uh, the, the system. Uh, here, the, here you can see like how much, like how it could work the model predictive control. You have a prediction horizon, for, for instance, in this image of 24 hours. Prediction horizon is when you, uh, the, the amount of time you, um, you let's say you analyze with the weather forecast. For, you analyze the weather forecast for 24 hours, and then you decide how to optimize the system in the next six hours. So this is the control horizon. So uh, the prediction model forecasts the thermal, the thermal load. The controls are optimized over the control horizon, respecting some constraints, of course, and the model predicts a control that can minimize the power peaks. And uh, the case study I'm working on is the uh, has been already uh, introduced already is Mirabel Quebec, it's a cold like the champ, where a five standing common wells heat pump system is replacing a fuel oil boiler. Here you have uh, a schematic of the, of the mechanical system, it seems quite a bit complicated, but I, I will try to, 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 to go a little bit, like uh, to explain a little bit how it's composed. So you start here in the, on, in, on the ground, so you have a five standing common wells and an injection well. Okay, and the plate is a changer that, um, that separates the groundwater uh, and the rest of the system. You have your water, here you have, uh, you have glycol water. That um, uh, glycol is used to avoid uh, freezing in that part of the system. Here you have two collectors, we have two water tanks for the cold water and the hot water. That these two collectors in, uh, will interact with uh, some heating devices system. The main one is the water to water heat pump that is here. Um, in red, and here there are also uh, two water to air heat pumps for two zones of the building. And then there is an auxiliary electric boiler in case uh, something goes wrong in the rest of the system. Uh, then you have um, the, how you transmit the heat to the, to the building. There are two ways here, like uh, you can either heat the air that goes to and then in the ventilation system, or you can also uh, heat the peripheral radiators. There are some convectors and radiators in the whole peripheral zones of the building. Um, and uh, so you have two ways of, of doing that, of, of doing that, of transmi transmitting the heat to the building. Uh, and my research objective, as I already tried to uh, explain, is to reduce the electricity peaks and thus operating uh, what, what is called peak shaving. Uh, but how this can be achieved? Uh, by, by anticipating the peaks that you have in the building. Uh, and you can anticipate it by rising the bleed. You, the more bleed you have, as uh, already presented by my colleague, uh, Gabriel Baudry, the more rise you bleed, the, you, the more you warm up the well and, the, and increase the performance. Then you can preheat the building simply, like you can just uh, before the peak, you preheat the building, so you, then you, have, uh, you can have lo lower peaks when you, when, you, when you most need it. And this is called load shifting. You shift the load in a, uh, before. Um, and you can preheat uh, also to some water st storage tanks, for example, and I use that water when it's more needed. The benefits of this is to reduce, reduce pressure on the electrical grid and to reduce capital and operations costs. Um, and it's achievable, as I mentioned, with model predictive control. Uh, so my methodology is divided in two parts. I will mostly talk about the first part because the second part is still future work. The first part is mostly about modeling. So I, I model the school in 3D. I model the heating, ventilation, air conditioning system in transit. That is a software mostly focused on, uh, on energy systems and buildings. And uh, also I uh, integrated in, in transit uh, together with MATLAB, the simulation with MATLAB. I introduced uh, also a ground response model. 
of the standing column wells. The second part that is mostly future work is about more on the controls. Uh, so like first establish a well-known conventional and uh, reactive that is much of the a rule-based control is the most conventional known system to assess the performance and then we go to a predictive control that is more, uh, more innovative and then try to uh, assess the performance of this new system. And so I will start here but uh, with the building model. Uh, I, first, I first went with a 3D model of the school uh, that you can see here. And then I, I, I managed to, to connect it to Transist, my soft, the, soft, the energy simulation software, and I collect then construction data. That is, um, it means uh, collect all the thermal capacities and the thermal resistances of all the, struts, of the, all the constructions uh, of the school. And uh, then I, I characterized the heat gains and the HVAC parameters. What, what it means, simply like uh, estimating how is the, how the high the heat gains, so how, uh, how much heat is already released inside the building uh, with occupancy so of people, basically lights, equipment, uh, ventilators, uh, and then uh, all the, uh, also the heat recovery that there is, that there is a heat recovery system in the ventilation, uh, and to assess what is the daily temperature set point and how is, what is the limit like the, the, system can pro, the, the system can give to the, to the building as thermal power. And I set up the, the model in transits with three, 23 thermal zones um, that so to have, to, to have a, a quite much detailed model of the building. Uh, then I proceeded uh, to, um, with the elaboration of my HVAC model, the heating ventilation air conditioning, and it is divided in four loops. So we, we can start here by the, uh, with the ground loop. The ground loop is where you extract the heat in the ground. That is, <laughs> must be known. Then you, th this heat it goes to the, to the heat one system. The heat system interacts with two loops, basically the source where you take the heat during the, during the, um, during the winter, in winter mode. And then uh, where you, uh, then the heat is then transferred to the, to, the, to, the, to, the, to the load loop. And then from the load loop, it goes to the building. In, uh, it's, the, it's the fourth loop on the right. Uh, so uh, here you can see, for example, the MATLAB model with its controller. Uh, and here you can see what, uh, what, I, what is, I, I talked about the water boiler. It's kind of an uh, auxiliary system, but it's, its use should be uh, it should avoided. Um, so it's only there like an, as an emergency, I say, an, an emergency device. Uh, then I have the, the thermostat that regulates the heat pump. For now, it's using like a simple dead, dead band control um, on the, uh, something from the buffer tank, the temperature of the buffer tank. And uh, here I have the, the loads, like the, the, the loads that are read here in the building loop are then uh, re read by the building model. The building model gives the, uh, what it needs and this loop like gives the, the amount of power that is required. Um, so as then I, uh, the last step is the ground, ground response modeling. So uh, my colleague before me like explained very well like what is the convolution, stationary convolution, also a non-stationary convolution. What I used in my work is a matricial form of it. Like you use a time domain convolution which you have transfer function G and, and the heat incremental load function F. And you, uh, you use a time domain but with a matricial form. This allows my, my simulation, that is a sequential simulation, time, time step by time step in transits, to be much faster, uh, about 400 times faster, I estimated, uh, than, rather than the standard form. And uh, uh, so we have to remind that this kind of type is a stationary convolution, so you use constant ground flow rates. But uh, as presented by my uh, colleague, uh, Gabriel Baudry, the non-stationary convolution has been developed uh, lately. And it will be used soon in a, in a similar, uh, like I will be soon using this convolution with this uh, material form. Um, uh, so you can see here the stand, standing column well model. Here, this was the 3D representation in COMSOL, multiphasics. That was the finite element model used by my colleague. And you have five standing column wells and an injection well. Uh, the transfer function, uh, what it is, the transfer function is basically uh, produced when you inject one kilowatt of power in the 3D model, uh, but it was already well, quite well, well explained before. And the flow rate I used is the maximum uh, uh, that has, has been like tried, tried out in the numerical model. 
that is 568 liters per minute. I, I use this the maximum because it's the, the one that is usually used when you are uh, in a peak demand. Right? When there is the maximum of the demand from the building. Uh, so the first the first thing I, I, I did is, was to um, try to validate my my methodology. So I first uh, started from the building model. I reconstructed the, from the bills, the electricity bills and the full oil bills. I constructed the real energy use of the building during several years. Um, but it's, it's, what's called, it's of course like a rough estimation. Like I, I had monthly data, I had to use some assumptions. Um, but it was just to, to, to put the things in context, like to know like if my simulation was on, I had at least the same order of magnitude uh, for the energy use. So as you can see here, that is a little bit of difference, but it's quite on the same, on the same order of magnitude. Uh, I did a similar thing for the standing column well model. Uh, so I just wanted to see if my, my MATLAB model implemented in transits had like uh, an accuracy to what an accuracy that was working correctly basically. So what I did here is to compare the two curves that uh, curves that I first simulated in transit and then in, uh, and then the MATLAB reference. And of course in, in transit model is not like the kind of is kind to emulate that, but there are other components in the system. Like there is a pipe, there is a pump and other things. So uh, I was expecting a little bit of difference. So the results here are not are not super good, like for the validation, but it's just uh, I just wanted to see that the model inside my 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 the MATLAB model inside my transit model was working correctly, um, and then I I proceeded with some preliminary results. So I still don't have the whole uh, prediction like model predictive control uh, um, done. So I just wanted like to to test a little bit my 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 model. Uh, with some setback strategies, like uh, what is a, a setback? A setback is when you uh, uh, there is a transition in the indoor temperature in the temperature of the school between night and day. So, for example, during the night is, you keep 19 degrees to save some energy, and then during the day is, is, you have 21 to keep like a, a, a nice thermal comfort. So, what what, what happens in, in this that you is requ requires quite much of power to heat up the school. So, what I did is to take also the the three uh, days that are the the most like demanding, the, uh, the most cold, um, and so uh, and then I, I proceeded with three scenarios uh, to try to, to test out to see there was some differences. So the first scenario is a fast transition. So you have uh, you pass by 19 degrees to 21 degrees really fast in one hour, and, and this requires a lot of power. Uh, I, I kept a, a bleed ratio of 20 percent. And then I, I did other two, uh, two scenarios in which I kept, I put the limit on the, ter on the thermal power that it goes to the building to avoid to have a fast transition like that. So, and, and I managed to, to have a transition of the temperature in just in three hours, so a bit more gradual, let's say. And then I tested out uh, in this configuration two different bleed ratios, 20 and 30%. Um, and here you can see the results, uh, preliminary results, let's say. Uh, so you have like three, three, the three scenarios. Here you have a fast transition in one hour. Here you can see that it's much more smooth. It's like in three hours. And you can see, and then here the second row, you have the power. In the blue is the heat pump compressor power. And in, in orange is auxiliary resistance power. So you can see that, for example, in, in two, scenario two and three, the, the, the power is kept. Like there's a limit to that. Um, when uh, when you trans when you make the transition make the transition uh, between night and day, and uh, uh, when is the is super fast. Not only the heat pump is um, requires much more power. There is also uh, uh, also the auxiliary water heater intervenes to try not to to have water freezing, but then you still go uh, below zero degrees. But as you as you see, uh, when you go to a more smooth transition, uh, the water the, the water doesn't freeze anymore. It's, okay, it's here in this with 20% bleed the ratio is still uh, near zero degrees, but you don't have freezing and you don't have um, you don't have uh, huge huge powers uh, power, power requirement. And in the third scenario, you uh, rise a little bit more the bleed to 30%. And what happens is that the the water temperature doesn't go higher than 1.6 degrees, uh, about 1.6 degrees. And and this is good because it's like keeps you in a, in a safe position, let's say. Uh, and then this is what uh, usually like when you, when you will require this, that much of power is like 
you will it's, it will be better to use the, the maximum bleed you, uh, you, you can. So uh, for these preliminary results, there are some limitations, of course. Uh, I was using an indoor temperature, I thought this is ideal. So it's, it was always like 19 degrees uh, constant and 21 degrees constant with the day. Um, and so it's not thermostatic control that is more uh, re realistic. Then the building, uh, the building is, was imposing its ideal loads on the heat pump. It was not vice versa, it was not the system to impose power on the building. And um, then the standing column well is still strictly, strictly stationary, as explained, and the heat of the control is still a simple dead band. So uh, the ongoing work was, is tr I'm trying to address the first two limitations. So this one, the indoor temperature control and, uh, and the building that is imposing the loads on the heat pump. So I'm trying to address this, uh, and I divided the load, the, the, the load, the building loop in two. And here I, I would, I would try to, put, to simulate like the ventilation, and here uh, I'm trying to simulate uh, inside the convectors and the radiators to have also thermostatic control here. Is that the first limitation is addressed uh, here? You can, you can see that there are some radiators that will that will hit any any uh, each of the rooms of the building, and each of them will be connected to a controller. In this case, it's a feedback controller that uh, that is regulated by the indoor indoor temperatures. It's a thermostatic, a more like uh, realistic thermostatic control. And the future work uh, is more about like uh, implementing the non-stationary convolution that was presented by my colleague, and uh, then assess the, per the performance of most com more conventional rule-based control, implement and model predictive control, and uh, uh, as a final step, try to uh, once you I have the model predictive control, trying to study and analyze the HVAC design, uh, uh, some HVAC design improvements, like for example, put a heat storage or uh, using different heat emitters and other things. Um, so I, I put the references afterwards in my, my, the question slide, but uh, here I, I, um, I finished my presentation. I thanks, uh, thanks for the attention to everybody. And uh, you can ask me questions now or you can contact me here at my email, researchgate and LinkedIn.